Commissioner Holzman is here. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, so are you about ready? Okay, good morning. We're on the record. Please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. This is the on the record presentation for commission questions in the file captioned as in the matter of the request of the Empire District Electric Company doing business as Liberty for authority to file tariffs, tariffs increasing rates for electric service provided to its customers in its Missouri service area. And this is file number ER-2021-0312. My name is John Clark. I'm the RLJ presiding over this on the record presentation and questions that's being held today, February 10th, 2022 in room 310 of the Governor Office Building in Jefferson City, Missouri. And the current time is 10 a.m. At this point, I'm gonna have counsel for the parties enter their parents for the record, starting with Liberty. Diana Carter and Dean Cooper. Thank you. Staff of the commission. Uh, Google Nurse with Mission Staff. Thank you. The Office of Public Counsel. Nathan Williams appearing on behalf of the Office of Public Counsel of the Public. Thank you. Anyone present from MECG? Good morning, Your Honor. David Woodsmall on behalf of MECG and the Empire District Electric SERP, SERP recipients. Thank you, Mr. Woodsmall. And on behalf of the Empire District Retired and Members Members and Spouses Associations, EDRA. Yes, Judge Terry here with two of these small offices for EDRA. Thank you. Renew Missouri. Good morning, Your Honor. Tim Opitz on behalf of Renew Missouri. Thank you, Renew. And finally, the City of Ozark. Anyone present on behalf of the city of Ozark? Judge, uh, that's being handled by uh, my law firm, so I will be my attorney. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jarrett. Okay, I'm going to remind everybody once again, if you have a phone, be sure that it is silenced. Um, if you are joining via WebEx, I'm going to ask that unless you're speaking, that you are muted. If you are joining us via WebEx via phone, um, and you wish to unmute to uh, make comments, you will need to dial star six in order to do so. I'm gonna ask that since this is an on the record presentation to um, answer commission questions and present the various uh, stipulations and agreement that before you speak, if you identify yourself so that the court reporter, uh, so that the court reporter knows who is speaking. I'm gonna begin with allowing uh, the parties to make brief opening statements, um, treat these openings regarding the various stipulations and agreements uh, as in a contested case, but understand the commission may have questions and may uh, at any time ask those questions. Um, if the questions are for a witness today, at least the first time that witness speaks, I would like to swear that witness in so that there's um, so that we have uh, a good record. Now the stipulation and agreements are not confidential, but if confidential information is for any reason introduced, I'd like the parties to let me know so we can go in camera if necessary. 
And the last thing that I want to talk about before we begin is um, there was a Surrey Bottle EMS run that was referenced in uh, the fourth stipulation, I believe. I don't know if it was referenced elsewhere off the top of my um, memory, but I had asked staff at one point to submit that, and they did. Is there any objection to the commission making that a commission exhibit as part of the record? Okay, I see none um, and hear none. So the, uh, is it staff sir bottle EMS run will be uh, admitted onto the hearing record as commission exhibit one. With that in mind, I'm going to start with opening statements. Starting, I'll go the same order that I called um, I will go in the same order that I called uh, four entries of appearance. So, Liberty, if you would like to make your opening statement. Good morning. I am Diana Carter, the Director of Legal Services for Liberty Central Region, which includes the Empire District Electric Company. In addition to Dean Cooper, I have with me today Empire's Director of Race and Regulatory Affairs, Charlotte Emery. And then we also have available by WebEx, attending with us Greg Tillman, Senior Manager for Rate Design, Aaron Dole, Senior Director for Energy Strategy, and our Vice President for Electric Operations, Tim Wilson. Four partial stipulations have been filed with the Commission. Taken together, they resolve all but one issue, the question of how Empire's revenue requirements should be allocated among Empire's customer rate classes, and we tried that issue here on Monday. All pre-filed testimony has been admitted into the record with no objections, and although the four partial stipulations were not signed by all parties, all non-signing parties have now stated their non-objections, so all of those stipulations may be treated as unanimous and approved by the Commission as a near global resolution of the case. Pursuant to the stipulations, again, taken together, rates stemming from this case will not reflect any increase. Your mic is off. To your left. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. I will periodically <laughs> kick that, I guess, if necessary. <laughs> so pursuant to the stipulation, rate stemming from this case will not reflect any increase related to Storm Uri, and Asbury will not be reflected in those rates. The Asbury AAO will continue with tracking balances reset to zero, no determinations regarding Asbury are being requested at this time. When the company filed this case with Asbury Recovery included, the company proposed to return to customers the Asbury AAO regular, regulatory liability going back to the retirement date of Asbury. That same proposal will be made by the company in the securitization docket. From our perspective, all issues on Asbury and Storm Uri will move to those securitization dockets. Disputes remain, including as to the AAO balances, but it is our position that all of those issues will be tried over in the securitization docket, but with additional customer benefits created by securitizing over there being traditional rate recovery. The first stipulation filed with the commission established some starting numbers using SAS rate base and other balances reflected in SAS the rebuttal filing. At the time, we assumed that we would be trying all of those separate revenue requirement issues. Numerous rate design matters were also resolved with the first stipulation including the establishment of tariffs to implement Empire's new transportation electrification program, no increase in the residential customer charge, 
and the creation of time of use or time variant rates for residential and small commercial customers. And there was an error in that portion of the first stipulation. As was noted, Judge, um, there are two subparagraph A's. And the second A should read time variant, as you had noted in your email yesterday. The time of use agreement of that first stipulation establishes a default, more limited at impact time of use rate for all residential and small commercial customers with AMI. As of today, approximately 99.5% of Empire's residential Missouri customers have AMI installed, with those customers having near real-time access right now to their usage information. We rolled out AMI to our Missouri customers using eight geographic sectors. All but the eighth sector has been completely accepted, and that should happen very soon. The time of use agreement from the first stipulation also maintains the option of the current non-time of use rate and creates a limited avail availability high differential time of use rate. This portfolio of rates will introduce our customers to the concept of time differentiated rate and will give the company an opportunity to understand how our customers respond to these new rates. Education of our customers is key, and the company supports the suggestion of filing and obtaining approval of the educational materials in advance of the new time differentiated rate options taking effect. <coughs> the parties continue to work together after filing the first stipulation and additional issues were resolved going down from the dollar figures that were agreed to in the first stipulation. The fourth stipulation then resolved the global issue of the appropriate annual revenue requirement increase with rates to be designed using an annual increase of approximately 35.5 million, which is an increase of approximately 6.4%. The revenue requirement portion of that fourth stipulation essentially supplants the initial dollar figures that were agreed to in the first stipulation. It's what we call a black box settlement, so we can't point to specific issue by issue resolutions and there is no agreed upon rate of return. The stipulated annual revenue uh, requirement increase is approximately $10 million below that's the rebuttal recommended revenue requirement increase when you exclude all revenue requirement components of Asbury and Storm Uri, which is what the parties have done here for purposes of settlement. The stipulated revenue requirement is a fair compromise and balancing of the various parties' opinions on the revenue requirement and rate-based issues. The parties also agreed to significant customer benefits outside of the resolution of the revenue requirement, such as continuation of Empire's low income pilot program, including with modifications to make it even more customer friendly, um, additional shareholder funding for low income programs, creation of a special employee position to be devoted to low income programs in Liberty Central Region, creation of a critical needs program with joint funding from customers and shareholders, and requirements for various additional reports and stakeholder meetings to maintain open lines of communication. We kept our focus on the customers and worked hard to minimize the rate increases uh, using the securitization legislation and working together with the parties on the four stipulations. The stipulated rate increase acknowledges the wind investments and other improvements to our system, like AMI, that will pay off for years to come for Empire, its stakeholders, and its customers. In conjunction with the one remaining issue to be decided by the Commission, we ask that the Commission approve the four partial stipulations as a just and reasonable resolution of the case. Thank you, and again, Charlotte, Greg, Aaron, Tim, and I, and Dean are available for any additional questions. 
Okay, thank you. And I'll note for the record at this point that all the commissioners are present uh, via WebEx. And if the commissioners at any time have any questions, uh, they're welcome to just interrupt me and ask them as to openings. Uh, next, would the staff of the commission like to make an opening statement? Just briefly, Your Honor. Everybody hear me okay? I think so. Okay. Um, this is Nicole Merz on behalf of the commission staff. Um, and I have with me today Amanda McMillan, uh, Kim Holden, Dr. Kim Juan, Sarah Lane, Mark Oberschweger, uh, Jay Lubert, Kim Cox, Senator Kernigan. There are probably a few others back there I'm missing. But if there are um, any questions that the commissioners have, um, they'd be happy to answer your questions. And if there's anything that, that that Motley group can't answer, mm -hmm. we will be able to find uh, and make available the staff witness who can either uh, in the hearing room or via WebEx. Uh, so staff echoes many of the comments that Empire had made about the stipulation. Um, we thought that this was a good resolution to um, the multitude of issues that were in the case um, that uh, pop up Office of Public Counsel staff and Empire along with other parties such as NECD were able to work to come to this compromise and to um, I'll highlight just a few um, significant ones for staff's point of view. Um, there is time of use in this case. Uh, we are beginning the process of educating customers on how the time of day impacts the cost of energy. It is opt out with a low impact differential to prevent large customer impacts. Um, Storm Uri and Asbury are no longer in the case. They uh, dealt with in securitization dockets. Um, the wind farms have met the in-service criteria, and Empire has agreed to some additional reporting requirements. Um, Empire has also agreed to some additional reporting uh, requirements on cheap investments and reliability investments. Um, as the company noted, the agreed to revenue requirement is $10 million lower than what was in staff through the EMS run as well. Um, so I am available for any questions, or if there's any questions for staff, we are happy to help. Thank you. Right, thank you. Public counsel? Thank you. May it please the Commission, uh, Nathan Williams appearing on behalf of the Office of Public Counsel and the Public. Like the other parties have indicated, it's the Office of Public Counsel's position that the stipulations taken together are a just and reasonable resolution of the issues in this case, aside from the rate design issue that has been tried. Um, among the things that Public Counsel views to be important about these agreements are the implementation of the time of use rate, the low income. Could program. you speak up just a bit? I'm sorry about that. And I'm trying to see if I can get the uh, the speakers turned up a bit in here. I really believe it's a connection problem. <coughs> um, among the things that the public council obtained in this case was a $20 million reduction in the rate base from what staff had agreed to in connection with the wind project. Uh, it is a black box settlement as to the revenue requirement increase and no specification of the rate of uh, return, including the return on equity and debt desired capital structure. Um, public Council got some uh, additional items, including the um, loss of load study which we believe is important for planning purposes for things like storm URI. Public Council also agreed that the storm URI impact and the Asbury impact are no longer to be addressed in this case. They're not part of the stipulation in terms of a resolution. I will anticipate those to be addressed in securitization cases. There is one pending securitization case for storm URI now. And there's been a notice filed for um, Asbury, and we anticipate that Empire will go forward with filing that application. And we'll be raising the same issues that we raised in the rate case and the securitization cases in terms of how the Commission should treat those in the under regular rate making for viewing what it should do on securitization. 
In addition, we got some clarification of the NPDM, which is the um, benefits to customers, or some assurance that customers are uh, limited on, somewhat limited on exposure in case the wind farm plan doesn't go forward as anticipated. And we also, the wind farm plan does not, projects do not reap the benefits that are anticipated. We also got clarification on the fuel adjustment clause and what is and is not included in terms of items that are part of the wind project in the NPPM. And with that, our witnesses are available to answer any questions the commission may have as I'm on. Okay, thank you, public counsel. On behalf of the Midwest Energy Consumers Group, Good morning, Your Honor, David Woodsmall. I'll be very brief. Um, we filed testimony on a number of issues that are covered in these settlements. Um, first, um, on revenue allocation, that's a live issue still. We tried it on Monday, but we filed testimony on rate design for the um, largest uh, rate schedules. This resolves that issue by placing 70% of any rate increase or large power class into demand charges. The remainder will be split between the energy charges. That's resolved by the first stipulation. The other issues that we addressed in our testimony relate to Asbury and URI. Um, our testimony on URI um, focused on the idea that those costs should be taken out of this case and should be uh, securitized as the company and others have um, uh, has stated uh, the company is taking those costs out and that securitization docket is um, fine, is filed now. Um, on Asbury, we filed testimony on a number of issues, including the retirement date, the um, quantification of the revenue or the regulatory asset and the regulatory liability flowing out of the last rate case um, and the need to securitize that. Um, the company has indicated has already filed a 60 day notice for the securitization of Asbury. Um, those costs and those issues have all been taken out of this case and will be live issues in that securitization case. So given that URI and Asbury are both taken out of this case and headed for a securitization docket, um, we're happy about that resolution. So that took care of all of our issues, except for the revenue allocation issue that I mentioned earlier. So um, if the commission has any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Otherwise, um, Greg Meyer, I know is on the WebEx call and can, it can answer any questions regarding the Asbury and URI issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Woodsmall. And I just wanna clarify for the record, you're not objecting to any of the stipulations at this point, correct? No, in fact, we are a signatory to the first stipulation and we're not objecting to any of the other three. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. Did the Empire District Retired Member and Spouses Association wish to make an opening statement? Yes, good morning, uh, commissioners and judges and judge. Uh, just very briefly, uh, also participating with me this morning, I believe by phone, is Bill Gibson, who provided uh, testimony on the uh, retirees issue in this case. Uh, this case, this uh, relates to stipulation number three as to EDRA. Uh, this makes some minor changes to the stipulation and agreement uh, that was approved in the 2016 merger case. Uh, from EDRA's perspective, these really aren't substantive changes. They are more clarifying, uh, basically clarifying the continued benefits of the retirees moving forward and also giving some clarity as to how, what these plan, what the plan might look like uh, going forward in the future. Uh, we agree with uh, Ms. Carter that uh, this is just and reasonable uh, and, and, and meets that standard. And uh, we look forward, to Bill and I, to any questions that the commissioners might have. Okay, 
thank you very much. Mr. Whitfall, did the SERP retirees wish to make an opening statement? Uh, just to note, Your Honor, that the SERP retirees were not um, did not oppose any of these stipulations. Other than that, we have no opening statement. Thank you. Any opening statement on behalf of Renew Missouri? Very briefly, Your Honor. Um, good morning. May it please the commission. Renew Missouri is a signatory to the first stipulation filed in this case, and we ask the commission approve that um, as a reasonable resolution to those issues. We are a non-objecting party to the other three stipulations, um, and we have uh, no issue with the commission resolving those issues uh, in that manner. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Jared, did the city of Ozark wish to make an opening statement? No, Judge. Okay, thank you. I'm going to note for the record that I had, um, because there's a lot of ground we're covering today, and there are a lot of questions uh, in order to keep the answers to those questions as concise and specific as possible. I distributed the questions to the parties so that they could properly prepare for them. The commission may have additional questions as we go along. Uh, the questions that were sent out were based on the first list of issues that was filed by the parties. And so when I reference like an issue 15, um, that's referencing the rate base issues from the first stipulation or not first stipulation, I'm sorry, from the first list of issues. So with that in mind, I'm going to go forward. It appears that, uh, Ms. McClellan, that most of these are going to be aimed at you, <laughs> at least initially. So I'm going to go ahead and swear you in. Would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. As I said before, uh, we're starting with issue 15, those are rate-based issues. Um, those would be the ones that were based on the SIR rebuttal EMS run that I had referenced earlier. And the first question was, um, can staff walk through the steps to reconcile the starting rate base amount of, and I believe it's $2 billion, $49,632,599, am I, am I correct on that? Correct. Uh, with its rate base Schedule 2 SIR rebuttal Story Bottle Accounting Schedules EMS run prepared January 20th of 2022 to identify the rate base items um, related to the Asbury power plant. Yes, on Schedule 2, there are two items that are related to Asbury. Um, and it's Asbury Retirement Asset and the Asbury Retirement Liability are the two items that are in the rate base. Okay. Is that the only difference between those amounts? No. There are, um, there are other taxes and tax impacts of the rate base issues. But those are the only Asbury ones? Yes. Okay. Um, question two, in regard to that issue, does the starting rate base amount represent Empire's rate base after the removal of the Asbury retirement asset of uh, 1297499 and the Asbury retirement liability of 46810043 that were included in the Surrey Bottle Accounting Schedules, or did those amounts change? No, those are amounts were removed. There are additional amounts for tax purposes that were included, and that was the main difference. And I'm sorry, if you, if you may be answering something, and I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question anyway, okay. so I apologize about that. Uh, the Surrey Bottle Accounting Schedule, Schedule 2, Line 41, Total Rate Base, is one billion nine hundred and fifty seven million four hundred and fifty thousand eight hundred and fifty two and that amount includes staff's Asbury retirement asset and liability adjustments to rate base, correct? Yes. Uh, does the two billion uh, forty nine million six hundred and thirty two thousand and five hundred and ninety nine starting rate base replace the line forty one amount? Yes, it does. And this is the difference, uh, that's the difference of about 92 million, is that correct? Correct. All right, I'm gonna move on to issue 31. And that's involving income statements. And again, uh, 
it's been recommended that you're the witness for that. If any of the parties have witnesses that at any time they think would be better suited to answer the questions, let me know. In paragraph two, um, includes a starting net operating income available of $104,315,916. Does this take the place in the Surrey Bubble Accounting Schedule, Schedule 1, Line 4, of the $100,596,932? Yes, it does. Now, later in paragraph two, it states the starting net operating income available is minus any expenses and associated taxes reflected in staff's case related to Asbury. Can you please explain what is included in associated taxes? It's the calculation of current income tax. And that's current income tax due? Based on, the, based on our EMS on its calculation of current income tax. Thank you. Are the Asbury expenses that have been subtracted in reaching the $104 million amount, those included in the Surrey Bubble Accounting Schedules, Schedule 10 related to Asbury's operation and maintenance adjustments? Yes, those have, those have been removed from the rate case and from expenses. And that's inclusive of operation and maintenance? Yes. And does the $104 million amount also reflect the removal of $4.4 million uh, Asbury AAO amortization uh, expense adjustment of, uh, of, of you? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. Sorry, it says staff witness McMillan. So. <laughs> and does your um, Asbury amortization adjustment include the Asbury AAO categories approved by the commission? In the last rate case for Empire, which is ER 2019 um, 0374? Yes. And I believe you were sent an email by Kim Bolin that has my work paper that shows all the numbers for Asbury. And I do. And I printed copies as well. I do believe I have received that. Has every other party had an opportunity to view that? Is there a party that has not received those work papers? I hear none and see no responses. Is there any party that objects to making those a commission exhibit? I see none. Um, McMillan's work papers are made commission exhibit two and admitted onto the hearing record. And finally, uh, in regard to this issue, does your Asbury AAO amortization adjustment include amounts recorded from January 2020 through June 30, 2021? Yes, it does. Thank you. Bear with me just a second. Okay, moving on to issue 31, and this is the Asbury issue, and that's paragraph four. Um, this paragraph seems to go beyond the settlement of issue 31, Asbury C, taken from the January 25th, 22 issues uh, list, allowing the AAO to continue. What's the purpose of staff's inclusion of a quantification of Asbury AAO amounts in paragraph four? That was just a staff balance of the AAO, but all those costs will be moved to the securitization case. Okay. And the, all the items, the baseline amounts will be reset to zero, and then the other costs will be continued in that tracker or in that AAO. Okay, and this is not on the sheet, and I'm just going to ask this uh, to the best of your understanding. There were. Um, There were gains that were received, at least I'm going to assume that there were gains that were received in regards to um, items that were still in 
uh, that the, the company was still receiving in rates after the uh, retirement of Asbury, are those, is, it, is it your opinion that those will also be addressed in the securitization docket? Yes, that's my understanding. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. I don't know who's best to answer these next questions, so I'm going to throw them out there and we'll see. And this is, and um, these are under the same thing, so I might, you, might, you may be the witness for these as well. Can staff provide a quantification by category of the Asbury balances at the end of the test year, in this case, June 30th, 2021, similar to that reflected in case, in the previous rate case, ER 2019-0374 Global Stipulation and Agreement, Appendix D, filed as Exhibit 750 in that case? Yes, that's what was um, since the judge and is now the exhibit. Okay, so that's what I just received, yes. and that answers that question. Thank you so much. Um, can staff identify where within Abit, and, and if this is answered within that, please let me know. Can staff identify where within Appendix D each category of Asbury AAO approved in uh, the previous rate case uh, amended report and orders included? It's included in my work papers, and then um, those amounts were put, uh, were put together and then included in rate base. Okay, so I'll be able to separately identify those. In rate base? Yeah, in rate base. I'll be able to separately identify those as, as rate of return on the Asbury plant. Um, as I have A through I listed there as yes. different different categories. Those are separately identified within yeah, those work a, papers. Um, the first page is the Asbury. Sorry. sorry. You have to let him finish. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Did you ask a question again? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I have A through I, and those list things like rate of return on Asbury plant, accumulated depreciation, accumulated in excess deferred income tax, eat it. Um, all of those items are individually noted within your work papers, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Can staff identify where each amount is in the SIR rebuttal accounting schedule? There were two amounts in rate base and one in the income statement that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then rate base, it was the Asbury retirement asset. So it's the accumulation of all the costs put together. And then also the uh, Asbury retirement liability. Is okay. in the right base. Okay, and that's what you talked about earlier, and the other amount was the taxes. Yes, and then there's also the amortization in the income statement. Now, why are your work papers for the period ending um, September 30th of 2020? Oh, that was just the test year in this case. Okay, so it's just... The calculations go through June of 2021. Okay, thank you. Can staff provide a quantification of the uh, OPC proposed AAO items in the commission's approved inclusion in the AAO through June 30, 2021? Yes, that's on the second page of my work papers. Okay, so that's in your work papers too. And I, I remember that because I had ordered each of the parties to submit a list of things that they would have liked included in the AAO. And with the, section of, with, with the exception of consolidating any doubles, um, it was a pretty extensive list. So cash working capital, income tax, uh, gross up associated with Asbury, fuel for SPP revenues or expenses associated with Asbury that did not flow through the FAC, and revenues from uh, scrap value or value of items sold are all in that second page of your work paper? Correct. Thank you. Can staff identify where each amount in the Surrey bottle is in the Surrey Bottle Accounting Schedules? It's the same answer for the accumulator costs are in um, rate base and then the income statement as the amortization. Thank you, and I know some of this is repetitive, but if you'll bear with me, mm -hmm. um, I'm not as technical, so these are questions that I need to ask. Now, quoting from paragraph four, the Asbury AAO authorized in the previous rate case for Empire will continue, but upon the effective date of new rates in this case, the baseline uh, balances are reset to zero. What happens to the amounts collected from the end of the test year, June 30th, 2021, to the effective date of new rates in April 2022? Those will be reflected in the securitization case. 
Okay. That actually answers my next question. Uh, let's move on to issue 27. That's class cost of service and rate design issue. Uh, are the customer charges reflected in attachment A to the fourth stipulation, the amounts to be um, implemented under paragraphs 16 to 19? If you'll bear with us, Frank, that is more appropriately directed to Sarah Laney, who will swap in and be able to answer um, the next round of questions. Okay, Ms. Lange, would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this on-the-record presentation is the truth? Yes. Okay, did you hear the last question, or would you like me to repeat it? Uh, I did. That would be the customer charges. That is correct. Uh, in paragraph, in attachment A to the fourth stipulation, uh, are those the amounts to be implemented under paragraph 16 to 19? Um, I was a bit confused by that because I think it's, the question should probably reference attachment A to the first stipulation rather than the fourth. That's where those customer charges are contained. Okay. Uh, um, with that change, can you answer the question? Yes. The, the purpose of the attachment A was to indicate what the billing determinants are in this case. And to that respect, the customer charge listed are, are incidental. Um, that said, for the agreement, most of the customer charges are remaining the same, and that would include residential, um, CBSH, and I believe Praxair is held the same as what was in the company's proposal. Um, the, there will be some changes to the customer charges experienced by some other classes. Okay, and those were the ones that were referenced by Mr. Woodsmall in his opening statement? Um, or am I in a different world? It, no, I, I'm struggling to recall exactly which one he said. Um, PSM customers will experience change in customer charge. Um, the GP and PEB customers will experience the change in customer charge. Okay, thank you. And... Um, Moving on to the next issue, issue 27. Um, are, are you the person also for these next few questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, would you clarify that the CB is a uh, commercial service? Uh, yes, uh, maybe commercial building, but yes, it, it is. I, I, that, that is the general character of customers that are served on that. Okay, and SH is small heating? Yes. And PFM is feed mill and grain elevator service? Yes. I think I saw that elsewhere in the case. Um, now, on page five, there are two items A that both state to produce non time variant rates following the procedure. The following procedure will be followed. Please clarify, clarify the second A. Uh, should that be time variant rates? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. On page five, the second item A for sub items I through our. Um, Roman numeral one through three, can you provide an example of how this would work for a hypothetical customer using 10,000 kilowatts hours a month? Uh, the short answer to that is no, but if I might explain. Please. Uh, the calculation that's provided there is to develop um, the rates that will be in the tariff, not for individual, you know, you wouldn't perform this calculation for an individual customer. We will perform this calculation once we get the report in order that tells us how much rate shifts to implement, and then that will be part of the published tariff that, that will be effective in you know, April or whenever that, that effective date is. Um, under the design that is contemplated, um, a customer using 10,000 kWh would see no more than a plus or minus $100 variation a month, and that would be a pretty extreme case. The average customer, average being a, a thing that doesn't exist, mind you, but the average customer will see zero bill variation and just to note that a customer using 10,000 kWh would actually be targeted for review and movement to a larger class under the terms of this tariff, um, given the size ranges uh, that are applicable to each class. All right, thank you. Now, what happens under the time variant rate to uh, winter reduction in the CB rates for kWh is over 700? The, the decline is preserved um, and I've prepared an example that walks through this on the residential rate schedule that I think might address some of these questions um, that, you, that were posed on the CB schedule. It's, it's just 
here as Apollo on the scale that occurs in residential. So I'll distribute that when we get to that point. Okay. And uh, we're going to move on to issue 27. Is that also an issue which you would best be able to address? It is. On page 7, items A and B under paragraph 19 both refer to non-time variant. Please clarify if the second A should also be time variant rates. Yes. On page 7, under 19B, I'm assuming that's Roman numeral 1, uh, the rates will be increased by 0.02 cents per kilowatt hour. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily. And to clarify, you said 0.02 cents is 2 cents or 0.02 dollars. Um, that, that will be the first step in the mathematic process, but then it will be adjusted back so that the rate design is revenue neutral to the increased rates. Um, and mathematically, I would expect that to be right around 1 cent, that the rates will actually be increased um, for the general period rates uh, with the two cent decrease to be applied off peak. So the, the two cents is just a starting point. Thank you, and thank you for correcting me. I didn't mean to misspeak on that. Under 19B Roman numeral 1 through 19B Roman numeral 3, would, exa would an example of the calculation be similar to what's provided for the CB rate class? Uh, yes, and, and I do have an example prepared. Um, I'll, I'll say that a customer using 2000 kWh, which would be on the, the larger side for a commercial customer, but within the realm of what we would expect in a high usage summer or true winter month, um, a customer using 2000 kWh would experience a bill change of no more than about $20 um, with average, uh, again, average not existing, um, results being zero. And I, I do have a calculation prepared today. Okay, did you want to present that now? Uh, if that's acceptable. That would be great. Judge, just as a minor point of clarification, on 19, you referred to A and B, and then you referred to the second A in the question. I did. Does it actually be that it should be time variant rate? Thank you for correcting me, Mr. Williams. Just a point of clarification. No, I think that's important. I want, I want as clean a record as possible. So if I've misspoken, please feel free to correct me. And you've provided this, and I'm assuming that this is demonstrative and not evidence. It is. Um, it is um, indicating if, if you step through the calculations, it provides the current, um, and this would be for a winter bill for a residential customer. Um, and that's therefore showing that tail block that, that was mentioned in the CB question, um, that the second block rate is lower uh, to start with. And then if you go down, it is showing that non-time variant rate calculation, which is contained under uh, letter A of each of these. And that's showing that the $13 customer charge is preserved. And this is just, I forget what number I threw in. I think I made it a 15% increase to the energy charges so that the math would show up. Um, but it, again, that's, that's purely demonstrative. Uh, that would be based on the outcome of the report and order. And so there you see the rates are going up. Um, and so then in example A, uh, where customer is perfect to average, um, you see where that two cent off peak usage rider has been introduced. And in this example, the customer's usage is 40% off peak. And so the bills or the, the charges for block one and block two have been increased by, the, I believe it is 1.8 cents per kWh. No, it is 0.8 cents per kWh, um, I think was the number that it took to balance out the two cents off peak discount, um, which then results in, if you see to the side there, the, uh, the customer's regular charges go up by $10.80, and then the off peak usage takes it back down to $10.80. So we still see that same bill of 186.54 from the implementing example rate increase example to the 186.54 to the customer usage is perfect average example. Um, and then below that, you'll see where the customer, uh, examples where the customer's usage is less off peak. I believe I used 20% off peak in that example. And uh, example C, customer usage is more off peak. And I believe I used 60% off peak usage in that example. And you can see that those two changes introduce a bill variation of $5.40 for a customer using 2000 kWh in the winter month. 
And just to clarify one more time, a lot of these are hypothetical because they're based ultimately on what the commission determines on a contested issue. Yes, it's just intended to show the rate design calculation. Okay, thank you. Now, under 19B, will customers' bills include separate lines for the KWHs calculated from 6 a.m. to 9.59 p.m. and from 10 p.m. to 5.59 a.m.? My expectation would be that there would be um, a presentation similar to what you've just seen on this example, where there would be lines for the declining block charge uh, in the summer of the flat charge, but still that those would be, you know, there would be the, the normal um, energy usage line, and then there would be an off-peak rider line. So it would give you the off-peak KWH, and the total KWH would be my expectation, but the company has tended to be very cooperative in working with staff and OPC and other parties to address that. And I'm hopeful that that will continue in this case. And so not by time, but more by on-rider or off-rider? Yes, because the, the on, if you will, under this design, the on portion is just normal. So it's, it's normal usage and then it's discounted usage. Okay, thank you. Um, Where's the proposed tariff language for the time variant rates? Uh, in the deleted language bin on my uh, desktop where we uh, <laughs> at the last minute converted very tariff language-y reading uh, items from the uh, stipulation to more uh, stipulation reading language. And that's how uh, I did silly things like accidentally have two letter A's in two different portions. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for answering that. How will Empire's opt-in time of use participation caps work with the time variant rates? They won't. They're, they're unrelated. Would you explain that to me? Um, so the, these rates that we've just been discussing are the generally, generally applicable rates that all Empire customers will begin paying in October of 2022 unless they take steps to say they don't want to be on that or unless they do not have an AMI meter uh, due to opting out. Um, the opt-in opt -in rates that are subject to caps are entirely separate. Those are high differential, and the customer would have to call up Empire or whatever means will be in place for them to say, we would like to participate in that. So as a educated guess, I would expect that a year from now, we will have probably 90% of Empire's customers on these um, low differential rates, maybe Five to seven percent on the, um, you know, on the opt-out non-time variant rates, or have opted out to the non-time time variant rates, and the I think it was 200 um, residential customers would be on, you know, as, as the most that would be on the high differential rates. Okay. And just to refresh my memory, I remember reading somewhere that one of those is limited to 2,000 participants. 2,000 sounds much better than 200. Now that I say that out loud, yes, I apologize. Okay. And what percentage of Empire, well, I, I'm sorry, I skipped over one. Paragraphs 19 and 20 seem to contradict each other. If so, which controls? If not, how do they work together? And uh, the, the bracketed language that, that was on the version says, or are they two different types of TOU rates, one with the low differential as proposed by staff, and then Empire also has the opportunity to offer the other opt-in TOU rate uh, that, that is the accurate characterization, that the low differential will be opt-out starting with fall bill, billing months, and the high differential will be opt-in starting with fall billing months. Okay, so it's the same as your previous answer. Yes. <laughs> hey, Judge, this is Commissioner Roop. Can I interject? Please. Go ahead, Commissioner. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. I just you're, you're on the line of questioning that I had a, a couple thoughts on. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Lang, so... The way I'm understanding it is that the the opt-in rates for the time of use. Am I understanding that, that that there's a two cent per kilowatt discount for energy between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m.? Not for the opt-in rates. The the opt-out rates are the two cent um, discount. The opt-in rates are more aggressive. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it is more what you would expect for a opt-in um, bill savings opportunity.
opportunities to attend the use. Okay, so the the default opt out rate is two cents. And you had spoke earlier how that was just a number, uh, but you thought it was actually going to be less. Was that was that doing differencing on the block rates, or or is that similar to what you're referencing here? No, I I must have been unclear in, in how I said that. Um, the two cent differential for the residential class will be a two cent differential. It is how much revenue recovery do you have to incorporate per KWH into the existing block rate in order for that uh, offering of the two cent differential to be revenue neutral? Okay, great, thank you. Um, is the opt in rate similar in design to the Ameren opt out default TRU rate for their customers? No, the opt-in rate, um, Mr. Tillman, I believe, is on the phone and can speak better to the design, but I, I think it's something like a, a three-to-one differential. Um, it's, it's fairly aggressive. It's, it's something along the lines of, you know, 20-some approaching 30 cents during peak hours and, you know, under 10 cents during off-peak hours is my recollection. Okay, so there's a larger <laughs> incentive um, for those that wish to participate. Um, just let me review my notes real quick. Pause for one second. Okay, yeah, I think you answered all my questions. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, what percentage of Empire's customers currently have AMI? Um, the opening statement by Ms. Carter uh, accurately reflected my understanding that I've received from company technical staff um, regarding that virtually all customers have AMI. It's just a matter of some final testing on a final tranche. Um, and I believe there's a handful of customers who have either opted out of receiving an AMI meter, or I think there's a handful of isolated technical circumstances where AMI metering is not feasible for customers who are on a very long, um, you know, kind of end of the circuit situation, um, but the company would be better um, better suited to, to correct anything I've misstated there. Okay, and, then, and I understand that you're referring to Empire's uh, opening statement, but that has no evidentiary value for us. So it, yes, that's, why, that's why I'm asking um, uh, an expert witness. Sure, and I was attempting to um, endorse in a manner that you could then cite the okay. specific percentage, uh, unless um, Ms. Parker would be so kind as to repeat it to me at this time. Uh, Ninety-nine point five percent. Okay, and so that's is, is that remaining point five percent? Is that, I'm going to assume that those are people that have opted out or just. Uh, that is my understanding. Yes. So, so in regard to there's nobody that had, that still has to. Um, by the October uh, 15th date when time of use starts, there's nobody at that point who will still have to receive an AMI meter who hasn't opted out. My understanding is there may be incredibly isolated um, in both the numerical and physical sense customers who will not have an AMI meter, and just in that respect, they will kind of be opted out by default. Um, the, the rate can't be built to a customer who doesn't have an AMI meter. Um, my understanding is on most systems, and I assume Empire's is not an exception. That's that's a matter of literally, you know, a handful of customers who are at the end of a very long circuit or uh, are in a very physically isolated um, location. Okay. Thank you. If paragraph 19 controls, time of use goes. Uh, let me see, let me clarify this for myself. I'm not sure I understand the question here, but I'm going to ask it to the best of my ability. Uh, I, oh, sorry. I, I think I do understand the question, but I think it was addressed in, in the response to your prior question, which is that if a customer has does not have AMI, either because they have opted out or that very small number who are, are physically unable to have that technology, they are effectively opted out of TOU. Okay, thank you, I see that. And that does make sense in, in, in that context. 
I know this has been an important one, and this is one that's been asked around. What, because obviously a commission concern is is what's going to be done to educate uh, customers about this, because this is a, a huge shift. What educational plans? Um, um, I don't know if this is better addressed to Empire because they're going to be issuing. What ed educational plans do you have prepared to educate the customers before that date? Uh, my note on there, I have deferred to Empire, um, but that said, um, we have more specific guidance than we have in prior stipulations provided in this first stipulation uh, regarding what should be included um, and what the focus of that planning for that information should be. And also, Empire has the advantage that a number of co-ops um, in its adjacent service territory has implemented um, daytime demand charges. Um, and so I, I think that generally speaking, customers in that area will be more familiar with um, the concept of time of use and, and off-peak usage um, than perhaps some of the other utilities have, have had with their customer base. Okay. Is there an Empire witness who could address this? Yes, Greg Tillman is available by WebEx. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Okay, Mr. Tillman, would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? I do. Did you hear the question, or would you like me to repeat it? I did hear the question. Um, so, generally, I guess we haven't got all of our detailed plans prepared yet, but... Uh, from from our initial direct testimony, uh, we identified several areas where we where we uh, will execute that campaign, uh, and and just to just to name a few of them, uh, bill inserts. Uh, we'll prepare an informational video. Uh, we'll do website landing pages on our on our website that that describe. TOU, how the costs are impacted, uh, how the, the rates themselves reflect costs uh, to provide that education. We'll uh, have a social media uh, presence and, and perform two specific campaigns, one a digital campaign and another a radio campaign. Uh, so as we, as we proceed from this point, we'll put together the detailed plans and have agreed with uh, with commission staff and OPC and Renew Missouri and any other party that wants to be involved in developing uh, materials and those campaign plans. Uh, we'll we'll be reviewing those with all the parties to make sure we're addressing the issues that they all would like to see addressed. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. This is a broader question. This, this last, next question is a broader question for all the parties in relation to that education. Um, would the parties object if the commission required the educational materials and plans to be filed in this case and approved by the commission at least 60 days prior to the implementation um, of time of use rates going opt out? Um, I have a concern with um, I, I would say just to make sure that all entities, the commission included, are on the same page um, regarding the timing at which the educational materials were made available to Empire customers. Um, I think through the course of the discussions that, that we've had um, with the Empire personnel, I was under the impression that the target to get the educational materials available was much more like kind of the beginning of summer, um, that time frame. So I don't think it was the commission's intent to imply that the education shouldn't begin until 60 days prior to, to that. Um, but I, I think that is a very workable concept, um, just with a, a targeting of, a, of an earlier date for that in, uh, education material to go live. Okay, so what you're saying is 60 days isn't going to work because you're actually looking at a 120-day at a campaign, roughly. Uh, yes. In regard to that 120-day campaign, would there be any objection from the parties in regards to filing those um, that educational material for commission approval? Not from staff, no. Um, I'm just going to go through the party list. Uh, Office of Public Counsel? No objection. Liberty? No objection. We support that. Um, uh, EDRA? No objection. Uh, SERP retirees? No 
objections from MECG or the SERP retirees, Your Honor. Okay, thank you for getting ahead of me. Um, uh, from Renew Missouri? No objection, Your Honor. And City of Ozark? No objection. Okay, thank you for going through that. And that doesn't mean that that's going to happen. I just wanted to clarify that in case that um, that is something the commission wanted to do, given that these are most of these stipulations are do not alter stipulation. I'm going to move on to issue 10, which is uh, uh, the green button issue. And I believe the witnesses I have, um, and thank you, Ms. Lange, um, the green button issue, which I believe is best addressed by the company's witness, uh, Greg Tillman, and by public counsel's witness, Jeff Mark. So with that in mind, um, whoever would like to take these, um, if you'll just let me know so that there's not people talking over each other, that'd be great. Empire plans to implement the time variant rates by October of 2022, um, but not provide customers access until March 30. 31 of 2024, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, I can address that. Please, Mr. Tillman, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so th these are really two different things. So green button itself is sort of a, a protocol or a technical implementation of how customers can access their data. The company currently provides customers with access to their data. Uh, they can log on to our My Account portal and view their their information and download download their consumption information. So it's it's not that customers cannot access their data today. The green button issue is will provide, uh, for lack of a better term, better tools for customers to access and download their data electronically. Okay, so they will be able to to see and dissect their time variant rates by October 2022. Yes, when when those rates go into effect, and and in fact today customers can see see their their usage data, and and how those impact their bills. So that's that's a, that's a function right now uh, that customers have access to. As it currently is, uh, what's <clears throat> what. What is the interval period that that data is made available? Might be stepping a little bit beyond my my expertise in our system, but definitely hourly, and it may be available to them in a in a smaller increment of fifteen minutes. But but absolutely, they can see it on an hourly basis. So no, it's it's not a timing thing where they have to break it down like you're you're you can only go up to a certain week or so. Right. It's, okay. Thank you. They can see it all the way down to an hourly interval that I'm I'm positive of, and and maybe even lower than that. The the green button <clears throat> capabilities when we provide those, uh, the data is available in 15 minute increments. So so it 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 would it it would you know be reasonable for them to be able to see that on a 15 minute basis at that point. But I'm not sure about the my account portal. As it is now, what specific um, what what specific time of use data will customers be able to see based upon the system as it is now, once it takes effect? So, and and this may take a, a little bit of work on our part, but we can provide them with their on peak and off peak usage. Uh, that will definitely be on the bill, uh, and and the the pricing around that. I'm not certain that we've we've got the designs in place to show them exactly uh, how time of use will impact them, but but the consumption data is certainly available for them to 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 view that. Because so, so they'll be able to see that on their monthly bill, but they probably won't be able to check that and when they check their AMI data online. Right. What what I don't know is is how exactly that will present itself to them. Uh, definitely, they can see their consumption data. I'm not certain how that will be tied to the prices on on the my account portal. Okay, I think I follow. Thank you. 
but but the desire would be to give them an op, you know a place where they can go and see how how their consumption impacts their business. Okay, what? Consumption impacts their bills. How they use their electricity will actually impact their the bill they pay in a month. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tillman, for clarifying. Moving on to issue 28, which is the, um, I believe it's AMI Advanced Metering Infrastructure, paragraph five, and this is for all parties. Paragraph five of the stipulation states that it addresses issue 28 related to AMI. The first question is uh, in the list of issues were the following. What return should be authorized for Empire on its capital investments in AMI? Uh, 43.4 million uh, when Empire does not have time of use rates generally available to all of its customers and B what return should be authorized for Empire on the net book value of Empire's retired meters. Um, the only time AMI was mentioned in the stipulation was under paragraph 23. Uh, could somebody please explain how and where the AMI issue was resolved by the parties in the stipulation? Ms. Carter. Thank you, Judge. Um, the subpart A, that issue was withdrawn by public counsel as part of the stipulation based on the fact that stipulation one creates time of use rates to be generally available for Empire's customers, therefore making subpart A no longer an issue. And subpart B, that is part of our black box settlement resolution on all revenue requirements. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the second stipulation, and this is issue three, reliability reporting. Um, and I believe the, the listed witness for this right now is Mr. Westfall. And Mr. Westfall, are you available? Mr. Westfall is not available for us today. Judge, I may be able to address these questions for Charlotte Emery if you're wanting someone sworn in um, to do that as well for the company. I think it might be something I can address. Them. Okay. okay. If, 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 if I'm given a preference, I prefer somebody I can swear in. Ms. Emery, would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? Now, one of the columns in Schedule JW1 uh, to Mr. Westfall's direct testimony is named Sum of Activity Costs. Can you explain what the information in that column represents? Yes. So it is uh, to represent the, um, the cost, the dollars spent to date for those specific projects. So that is costs, cost to date? Correct. Thank you. The last paragraph, the last line in paragraph two references the additional information. What is the additional information that this is referring to? Sure. So that is one of the reasons we were meeting or requested and agreed to meet with the parties is just to get a better understanding of what additional information is needed um, and requested by the parties. The schedule itself is not a normal schedule that the company on a normal basis, and it was only prepared for testimony purposes. So we were just had a desire to meet with the, the parties just to ensure that we reported the additional information as they had wanted it. Okay, is there additional information? Or is that unnecessary at this point? Well, well depending on what staff I think was the individual uh, party that was wanting the information, depending on what they may want in addition to what was already reported. Um, there may be other factors or other items that they would like to see that you know, the company would be willing to, to bring forth from if it deemed it valuable. Okay, so at this point there, there was, there's nothing specific contemplated, but what you're telling me is that the company's opening to providing additional information should staff request it. And staff is the determinant as, as to what that additional information is. That is my answer. Okay. Um, the 
This may be the same exact answer, but I'm going to ask it. What additional information should be provided in your schedule to provide staff and OPC with a status on reliability improvement projects? Yes, similar to the same answer that I was provided, you would need it to meet or have a desire to meet with the parties to determine if anything else is needed for this reporting. So again, that's on request. Yes. Okay. All right, I've got... Um, Mr. Dinderloo and um, OPC witness uh, Jeff Mark. I apologize. Looks like uh, Mr. Dinderloo might not be. Oh, he's on, he is on WebEx available for your questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and swear because I'm sure they're going to come up both. Mr. Dinderloo, I'm going to swear you in, and then I will swear Mr. Mark in, and then I'll ask the question and see who can best answer it. So, Mr. Dinderloo, would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? I can't hear you. I believe you're muted. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you so much. And um, Dr. Jeff Mark, would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Raise your right hand to be sworn. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? I do. And I'm getting a little feedback, and I believe, Mr. Dinderloo, that may be from you. You may want to mute in between, you may want to mute in between uh, when you're not answering a question. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, the last line in paragraph two uh, references the additional information. Oh, this is a very similar question. What is the additional information being referred to? Um, is it in addition to what's listed in Schedule JW-1? Who would like to answer that question? Seems like that would be a question for you, Mr. Denderloo. Do you, is the, does staff have contemplated additional information at this time? Additional information at this time. Uh, yes. The additional information refers to information in addition to those that are recorded by. Could you speak up a little bit? CSO. Could you speak up a little bit? Can you hear me now? A little bit better, yes. A little bit better, yes. Okay. I tried to get closer to my microphone. So uh, the additional information here refers to those in addition to the information that is currently recorded by. Commission Rule 20 CSR 4240 23 Part 10 Section 9, which is about uh, annual reliability improvement programs. That oh, hold on, just a second, Mr. Dinderloo. Uh, we're all having a little difficulty hearing you. A little difficulty hearing you. Right. I'm going to get the microphone as close as I can. And can you say that one more time, uh, can you say that fairly loud? Fairly loud. Yes, the additional information is in addition to those information that are required by Commission's rule on providing annual reliability improvement programs. This information is not in addition only to the West Falls schedule, but in addition to those. But only to West Falls schedule. But only to West Falls schedule. Yeah. So uh, I have listed the uh, series of items in my rebuttal testimony on its last page under the last question. Such information can include, but it's not limited to a justification. Mr. For Mr. Mr. Dindaloo, I'm Mr. sorry, the court reporter can't hear you. I'm sorry, the court reporter can't hear you. Okay. Now, I can so hear maybe, you maybe enough to... I can hear you enough to catch part of it. So would you tell me... You said this was listed in your testimony. What page... Listed in your testimony. Listed in your testimony. The very last page of my uh, testimony under the last question. Very last page of your testimony under the last question. Very last page of your testimony under the last question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What additional information should be provided in the schedule 
to staff and OPC with the status on the reliability improvement projects. Estimated start and finish dates of projects, actual start dates, projected finish start dates, budget percentage, and percent completed on schedule. I'm trying to see if there's a way I can condense that down to a short question. Judge, this is uh, Jeff Mark. All of those factors would should, can, can and should be considered. Okay, all of those factors should be considered. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to look at this and, and make it a little clearer. All of those questions? Yes. So you believe additional information in regard to all of those items should be provided? Th that, that seems eminently reasonable. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mark. Okay, now there were no questions in regards to the, oh, and I'm sorry, I was just reminded I did not swear in Dr. Mark. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and ask you the same question again. I did, okay. Somebody had indicated they didn't think I had. Judge, if we could go back to the EMI. AMI. Public Council, of course, did not join in the first uh, non-unanimous stipulation and agreement where that issue was addressed. But from our perspective, with the time of use rates that were agreed to, that implementation, and the agreed to revenue requirement increase at rate base, that issue is resolved. Okay. So from OPC's position, that's resolved. Yeah, that's characterized as it was withdrawn, but yes. Okay, I, I thank you for the clarification. All right, since I'm not going to ask you that question again, Dr. Mark, if, if, since I've already sworn you in. I'm going to move on. It appears that there's no questions from the commissions in regard to the EDRA stipulation. So um, I'm going to move on to stipulation four. Oh, Mr. Jarrett, you had something you wanted to say? Yes, Judge, if uh, there are no questions, uh, then may Mr. Gibson be excused for the rest of the hearing? I can think of no reason I would need him here, so yes, that would be fine. Oh, thank you, Judge. And Mr. Gibson, you're excused. Okay, I'm going to move on to stipulation four, the last stipulation. Again, the um, uh, and the issue numbers on this are based on the amended issues list and not the first issues list just for everybody's reference. So let's go to issue 26, Asbury, and this, Ms. McMillan, is again, appears to be a question for you. Uh, issue 14, rate-based issue, is one of the Asbury AAO categories the commission authorized to be posted to the regulatory asset liability accounts. Um, all right, it says rate-based, I'm sorry. Issue 14 is one of the Asbury AAO categories the commission authorized to be posted to the regulatory asset liability accounts. What amount did staff include in its Surrey Bottle EMS run for this category? Um, that is one of the amounts in rate base, Schedule 2. Um, it's included in the Asbury Retirement Asset. Okay, where would we? I, I say that again, please? It's included in the Asbury Retirement Asset of 1.3 million. Is there a way, is there a place I would find that with particularity laid out separately? Yes, in my work papers. So that is available in your work papers too? Yes, it is. Do you know which work paper it's on off the top of your head? I believe it's included in first and second page. Okay, first and second page. Thank you. And uh, the next question seems to be for, uh, there's a number of witnesses that could uh, answer this from Mr. Graves. Mr. Oleg Schlager, um, uh, Dr. Mark, and possibly Mr. Meyer for MECG. Now, as I understand it, the issue and all sub-issues related to Asbury and the related URI storm costs are withdrawn from this case and are to be addressed in securitization. Is that correct? Who can answer that? Charlotte Emery is here to answer questions related to the Asbury and storm URI accounting matters. The company. Okay, did you hear the question, Ms. Emery? I did. Okay, can you answer that, please? Sure. 
All issues on Ave Gary and Pam Uri will move to the securitization docket. Disputes remain, including um, the AAO balances, and those will be tried in those respective uh, securitization dockets. Okay. Um, and this may be outside the realm of that question. So are all AAO issues as related to Asbury moving over to the securitization docket? Yes. Thank you. Issue 26 C and D, which again is, uh, I believe the um, Asbury issue again, relate to what should be the balances of the Asbury AO regulatory asset and liability. How are the regulatory asset liability addressed in the fourth stipulation? They are addressed uh, to move over to the securitization docket. So same answer. And you already answered the next question. Are those amounts set? Are they considered in the revenue requirement in this case? No, sir. Okay. Is that no to both? They're not set and they're not considered in the in the revenue requirement or they're no to both. No to both. Thank you. And do the parties envision the commission making a determination as to the regulatory asset and liability balances in the securitization? Yes. Okay. So you believe that those are within the realm of the commission's determinations in the securitization? Yes. Are the balances going to be netted and treated as an, a, an offset of the Asbury stranded investment to be securitized? Okay, um, and this is this is a, a more difficult question. Under what legal authority can the uh, asset and liability balance be considered addressed in the securitization docket? And I think what they I think what this question gets to is, I don't see a mechanism in in these uh, the new securitization statute to net um, to net things. I, I just see a way we port over. It appears securitization just addresses costs. I'll repeat the question. Um, under what legal authority? Yes. This Who's is Dave speaking, Woods. Please. This is Dave Woodsmall. And to the extent you're asking for a legal response, I, I would say the commission's ability to in, to net those is included in is implied in its ability to set the amount to be securitized. So while it's not stated out explicitly, it's certainly implied in the ability of the commission to set the amount of the securitized um, cost. So it is your opinion that that in determining what costs are securitized, it is that the commission has the authority to reduce that amount, um, reduce the cost securitized. That is my opinion. It's not something that the parties have talked about and is agreed to in any way. Judge, this is Nathan Williams. Um, give me just a second, would you? And that brings me to my next. That's Mr. Um, that's Mr. Woodsmall's opinion. I'm going to ask, is that the opinion of the other parties? Is that Liberty? Is that your opinion? Judge, uh, the company concurs that the securitization statute will allow for that netting. Um, I read it as being implied in the definition of energy transition costs, where it lists specifically things to be included, but the statute specifically says that's not an exhaustive list. And I do remember that in there. Is that staff's position as well? Um, yes, Your Honor, and, and unfortunately, I'm trying to read from a, a cell phone, but there is language in there about um, the commission can consider any appropriate factors to make sure that the securitization is in the best interest, and we believe that um, any offsets would be included in that. Okay. Can you cite me to that portion of the statute, please? Uh, let me scroll back. Uh, yeah. And while while you're while you're asking that, I'm going to ask since I got the other parties here. Is there any party with did that disagrees with that assessment? And that includes parties by WebEx. Okay, I hear no disagreement.
and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just, off the top of my head, I don't remember that language. Uh, if not to hold everybody up, I can <laughs> look through this under less pressure and email it to all the parties and the judge and the commissioners. Is that acceptable to you? That's acceptable to me. Okay. Since I'm merely asking for a citation. So <laughs> I'm going to skip over the next question since that seems to have been answered. And we're going to move on to issue 20, the transmission tracker, paragraph one. Um, and this appears to be a question for Mr. Dole, um, Ms. Bolin, and Ms. Mantle. Uh, the stipulation says that the issue is resolved, but no reference is made to it in the body of the stipulation. So as uh, liberty for the purposes of this case and without prejudice in future cases withdrawn its special request for a transmission tracker? That is correct, Judge, and Aaron Dole is available. He would be this issue and the next. Okay, I'll go ahead, uh, Mr. Dole. I'm going to swear you in. Would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? Yes, Judge. Okay. Has that uh, has that transmission that request for a special transmission tracker been withdrawn? Without prejudice, yes, it has. Okay, that answers that question in its entirety and very succinctly. Thank you. I'm going to move on to issue 18. This is the market price protection mechanism. This is the one that I believe was approved in a uh, in a stipulation filed in a prior case. And the commission basically has some questions about uh, how that stipulation is going to survive um, changes that are being proposed in these stipulations. Now, the stipulation filed under EA. 2019-0010 states that the revenue for the MPPM will be calculated based on SPP revenue. But the, uh, the fourth stipulation states in response to issue 18A, is it necessary and appropriate for the commission to make changes to the MPPM in this case? Um, is that for clarification only? And I may be misreading that. Let me move on and maybe the next question. Because <laughs> that, that, that first one does not appear to be a question. Maybe the second one is related. In response to issue 18B, Roman numeral 3, in the fourth stipulation states that the revenue included should be all revenue returned to the customer, including SPP, IM revenue, REC revenues, PAYGO, value of tax credits, and all miscellaneous revenues. The stipulation has revenue as the only, as only the SPP revenue. Please explain how this clarification is not a material change to the approved stipulation. Thank you, Judge. The company views this as a clarification but if others view this as a change, it should only be considered a change that further provides clarity to ensure what the customers are truly paying and receiving are more accurately represented. The construct of the agreed MPPM was preserved, but further granularity was provided similar to sort of an FAC level of specificity to ensure that the calculations made and ultimately decided 10 years from now at the conclusion of the MPPM are as accurate as possible. Thank you. Now, paragraph 21C in the second sentence states, balances as of the end of each MPPM year will be submitted to the commission 60 days following the end of, of each MPPM uh, year. Would you clarify what is meant by balances in the context of the terms used in the fourth stipulation? Sure. 
The balances ought to reflect the different costs and revenues as outlined in the non-unanimous stipulation and agreement in the EA 2019-0010 docket and then further refined in the stipulation and agreement number four in this docket. And, and I'm just going to ask, maybe you can reconcile this for me and maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but um, you said previously to be determined at the end of the 10 year period from its, I guess it's implementation. Um, and then these balances are to be submitted to condition. Um, the balances each year are submitted to the commission. How are those yearly balances determined? Those balances are determined by the calculation of the different components that go into the MPPM construct, namely the revenue less the wind revenue requirement plus the PPA replacement. And the idea between, between the balances be, being provided annually is just to kind of give an update. But as the MPPM was constructed in the 2019-0010 docket, uh, the li any liability that could be created would be dealt with at the conclusion of the 10 years. So this is just going to give kind of an annual representation of where those balances stand. Will that annual representation be based on this commission's order in this case? I believe that it will. So it's based upon the rates as set in this case? That is my understanding. And this is a rather long question. I'll do my best not to butcher it. Related to the MPPM issue, 18B Roman number two reads, what costs should be included? Similar to issue 18B Roman number three, similarly, eight, issue 18B Roman number three reads, what revenue should be included? The language resolving these issues in the stipulation is very general. The original report and order requiring implementation of the MPPM adopted the specific MPPM mechanism outlined in Appendix B to the non-unanimous stipulation and agreement filed in that case. That appendix sets out a very detailed list of items to be included in the mechanism for calculating the wind revenue requirement and annual wind value. Is it the understanding of the parties that this general language somehow alters the requirements set out there? I'll leave it at that for right now and then ask the follow-up question if necessary. Okay. Is that the party's understanding? I can speak for the company. Um, the company's position is that the language does not alter the agreement, but further refines the agreement to ensure an accurate representation, costs and revenues paid for and received by customers as possible. And while maintaining the construct and the spirit of the MPPM as outlined in EA 2019-0010. So we see this as a companion piece to further refine where we thought there could be some additional questions as far as ambiguity. Okay, so it doesn't alter any of that, but it either clarifies or adds to. That is and I'm correct. assuming adds, adds to would be incorrect, actually. It just, it doesn't alter any of those amount, any of those items. Correct. It is the company's opinion in that it just provides further clarity into those components. Okay. Um, Ms. Boland, do you, do you want to address this? I can with Mr. Dahl. Okay. Can I swear you in first? Yes. Would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on the record presentation is the truth? I do. Okay. Uh, would you please repeat your answer and then explain to me? Yes, I concur with Mr. Dow. This is just a clarifying costs and revenues that are to be included in the MPPM without changing the construct of the stipulation for the MPPM. Okay. Are there specific modifications being made? I don't believe there's a specific modification that would change the whole way we constructed the MPPM, the whole purpose of it. Do you think these are mostly clarifications, not all of them? Now, the original MPPM had uh, a summing of the annual amounts for the final determination. Is that being changed? I don't believe it is, no. 
Are any of the components changing? I think we've added a couple of revenues that were not listed previously. Okay, those are added, but the, the, are, are none of the previous components are being lost. Correct. Um, Ms. Mantle, uh, would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? Yes. Do you concur with Ms. Boland's um, assessment in regard to that? Uh, with a, uh, respect to the annual amount, um, what was clarified in this agreement that was not in the last agreement was that interest as a long-term borrowing rate would also be included so that uh, the time value of money is included in the analysis that was not specifically stated previously in the, the previous stipulation. Okay, so all of the previous components plus these that the, that the parties have felt are now necessary to add in? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna move on to allowance for funds used during construction, AFUDC, um, and this appears to be, uh, thank you, Ms. Mantle, and Ms. Bolin. Um, this appears to be, this is issue 22. Uh, this appears to be for um, OPC witness, um, David Murray, and Empire witness, Mooney. Um, are both of those witnesses available? Charlotte Emery will be able to answer these questions for the company. Okay, Charlotte's already been sworn in. Um, Mr. Um, Murray, I'm going to go ahead and swear you in. Would you raise your right hand to be sworn? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on the record presentation is the truth? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Now, paragraph 26 states that the parties agree that the AFUDC will be calculated in accordance with FERC Uniform System of Accounts for Electric Utilities. Does anything in this agreement impact the decision the Commission made regarding AFUDC um, in the previous uh, Empire Rate case, ER 2019-0374? No, it does not. Thank you. Um, and moving on to issue 21, um, which is uh, rate of return and capital structure, um, and it appears potential witnesses for this are, again, I assume it's going to be Emery and you, Mr. Murray, and uh, Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong, do you want to raise your right hand just to be sworn in in case you have to testify? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you may be asked to give at this uh, on the record presentation is the truth. Yes. Thank you. Now, this is paragraph 26. This paragraph states, for the purpose of the calculation of rates, Empire's revenue requirement increases increase is an annual increase of 35513913 Based on this agreement, what weighted average cost of capital do the parties plan to use in future cases? There is no such number. Why not? Because it is a black box. There is no. Okay, so the, and that is an acceptable answer. So that is part of the black box. Yes. Um, if and um, is there a number agreed to? And that may elicit the same answer. Do the parties have an agreement as to what that number is? No. I know. I'm just going to answer. There's a lot of shaking of, of heads. Can somebody say that out loud? This is Nathan Williams for Public Council. No. Thank you. Um, with that in mind, if there's no number agreed to at this point in time, uh, what number is going to be agreed to for, or what number is going to, what is the number that's going to be used for the upcoming securitization case? From public counsel's position, I don't anticipate we will be using weighted average cost of capital, and it would, I anticipate, be a litigated issue potentially in those cases. And and why wouldn't you be using the weighted average cost of capital? The 
raspberry asset is no longer used and useful, we don't view that there should be any return on investment for the remaining value. And as to your reform costs, those are fuel and purchase power costs, which are expenses, not capital items. Okay, thank you. And is staff's assessment the same? It is, sir. Uh, Mr. Oleg Schroeder, can I swear you in? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give at this on-the-record presentation is the truth? I do. Okay. Can you tell me that again? Sure. The, um, to, to expand on perhaps what Mr. Williams was alluding to a little bit, um, the good or bad news about securitization is most weighted average cost of capital or cost of capital. Would you speak up just a touch? I apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, in a securitization context, most of the cost of capital issues you would be facing in a general rate case will not be relevant because of the way the interest rate is set on the bonds and so on. So um, there is, based on a reading of the securitization law, there is no requirement uh, that a preset weighted average cost of capital or any other cost of capital value be determined for use in a securitization case. Okay. Thank you very much. Those are all the questions that were submitted to me in, in writing in regards to having the parties answer the questions today. Are there any additional questions from the Commission at this time? Okay, I hear none. I don't have any additional questions. I would, however, um, I know those were an extensive uh, number of questions. And uh, myself and, and the Commission genuinely appreciate the effort and time that's uh, gone into answering those questions for us today. Um, is there anything further at this point uh, that this Commission needs to address today? Um, I did find that citation for you. Okay, would you go ahead and give it to me? I've, sure. got, a, I've got a pen handy. It's under 3CA, and I can read the, the quote out for the record as well. Please. The amount of the securitized utility tariff cost to be financed using securitized utility tariff bonds and a finding that the recovery of such cost is just and reasonable in the public interest. Uh, that's the portion that staff would believe uh, allows the commission to look at any offsets to um, the amount to be secured. Okay, to, to net the cost. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Maris. Is there, is there anything else that the Commission needs to address at this time? Is there anything pending from the parties that the Commission needs to address? I see none. Okay, again, I would like to thank you all for your time here today. I'm going to adjourn this proceeding and we will go off the record. Can I have one procedural question? Yes. Um, I mean, yeah. can we, I'm going to go back on the record um, for a procedural question. We're back on the record. Uh, yes, go ahead. You have a procedural question? Yes, we have briefing scheduled. Are you uh, contemplating the briefing just being on the one contested issue? That would be my assumption because this was to, this was about the stipulations today. So that would be my assumption. If for some reason I'm told otherwise, I'll issue an order letting the parties know. And if you'll remember, I moved the due date of the initial briefs, I believe, one day to the 25th. Um, as long as we're on the record, I, I did get one additional question, it appears. Um, and and it, it goes again to that weighted um, cost of capital. And it appears that that is that is used for the NPV calculation. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Uh, yes, it. Yes, it does. And um, is that in securitization? That is securitization. I think uh, there's certainly no uh, predetermined method for determining all the assumptions that go into the NPV. Uh, analysis, and I think each party potentially could argue. Propose. Okay. So, so your belief is that weighted cost of capital number would be ultimately for determination by the commission? Uh, the appropriate value for the NPV, yes. 
which could be the way to average cost of capital. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anybody else who wanted to address that or further expand on it? All right, then I will do what I just did a, a minute ago. I will adjourn this hearing and we will go off the record. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much, Chairman.